And now a conversation about how to navigate the changing media landscape as we grapple with disinformation, polarization, and cancel culture. What is the place of opinion journalism? Kathleen Kingsbury is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and this year she took over as opinion editor of the New York Times. Here she is speaking with our Walter Isaacson about modernizing the digital age. Thank you, Bianca and Katie Kingsbury. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So you've taken over the opinion section of the New York Times just at a time when Substack is coming along and having great opinion essays. Podcasts are hitting us. We're entering this new age of opinion journalism around the web. Uh, tell me, how does that affect what you're going to do? How are you modernizing the opinion sections of the New York Times? Thank you. It's a great question. You know, I think in opinion, just like our newsroom, really always aims to have the highest quality journalism across the most innovative forms. And in opinion, we have spent the last three years really modernizing our report. We now have a video team, an audio team, a newsletter team, a graphics team. Um, it's a really big investment by the times to make sure we are reaching as wide of an audience as possible. But it also hasn't really changed anything about the fundamentals of what we're trying to do day to day. We are trying to be the most powerful report there is in the world for ideas journalism. Um, we are trying to elevate honest debate. We are going to serve our audiences with opinions that they agree with, opinions that they don't agree with, opinions that we don't agree with sometimes. Um, but we think that's really important for ultimately helping them wrestle with and grapple with the challenges of a changing world. You talk about providing opinions that your readers may not agree with, you don't agree with. You've changed the name op-ed to guest columnist, but uh, there seems to be some thought that you're constrained at times for how far you can go, especially to the right, after Senator Tom Cotton wrote an editorial that caused your predecessor uh, to have to step down. Uh, I know those were complicated situations, but do you feel that the New York Times is constrained, especially when it comes to very conservative and populist voices? We are constrained in the fact that we don't print things that are inaccurate. And sometimes some of the voices on, on the right are making claims that we simply can't fact check. Um, that said, I really don't feel constrained. I mean, we have um, in our report almost on a daily basis, a wide range of voices and viewpoints. Uh, we are trying very hard to serve as wide an audience as we can. Just a small example uh, for a New York City issue, we had uh, editorial that was suggesting that it was a mistake by the Pride organization here to exclude police officers in uniform from marching in their annual Pride parade. Tomorrow, we're going to have an essay by Roxane Gay talking about why it's so important that police officers come to the parade, but out of uniform. Well, let me uh, push on where the line may be. I mean, would you feel comfortable running <clears throat> a guest opinion piece against vaccinations, say an anti-vaxxer? Oh, it's a, <laughs> that's a hard one. Uh, probably not. Actually, I mean, we, you know, at, at our core, we don't want to misrepresent science. And when it comes to the anti-vaxxing uh, movement, they often try to uh, push dangerous narratives around science and what we know to be true about public health. That said, you know, the anti-vaccine movement is a particularly interesting one because it's become so political. And so there are people, I think there are arguments that we could have in our report that explain people's hesitancies around getting vaccinated without it necessarily sending the wrong signals around the science here. I've been watching uh, your coverage as well as opinion of the mayor's race uh, in New York City. And the opinion section seems to be far more transparent than the old days, where you never could figure out how do they make that decision. And we're watching interview after interview with the mayor's uh, candidates uh, that y'all have been doing. Tell me about uh, how conscious it is that you're changing the transparency of how you make your decisions. 
I think given the mistrust in media we've seen in recent years, it puts a really big onus on us to be as transparent as possible and as inclusive about how and why we do the journalism that we do. So you mentioned the change to guest essay from op-ed. We made that decision because um, the New York Times was the pioneer of the modern op-ed page. It's a legacy we're very proud of. It expanded the opinion journalism ecosystem really dramatically when it was introduced in 1970. That said, it really is a print construction. Op-ed meant literally the page opposite of the editorial page. In the modern digital era, not very many people understand what even the editorial page is, not, you know, regardless of the op-ed page. And so we decided to find a phrase that was clearer, that provided more context, and that created more differentiation between news and opinion. Readers in our research groups really immediately grasped what guest essay meant. And in particular, they understood what the relationship between the writer and the New York Times was. This, these are outside writers who are contributing their authority, their expertise, or their experience on the topic that they're writing about. Do you think we naming it as guest essay and making it far clearer what the relationship is with the New York Times, does that allow you to have a broader platform, so to speak, in which a Tom Cotton or a Marjorie Taylor Greene could write something and the New York Times would feel more comfortable printing it, even if you thought some of the facts might not be totally correct? No. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't publish things that are factually incorrect. That said, um, I do think that there are arguments that both Tom Cotton or Marjorie Taylor Greene could make that we would be willing to publish. Um, for instance, Tom Cotton wrote a, a piece about Greenland for us just a few months before the op-ed that we ran that be, proved to be controversial. Uh, I could have seen even that op-ed from June of 2020 being something that we could have run if there was a really central idea to it. Tom Cotton is a military veteran. He could have spoken from his own experience in a deep way about um, why military officers and uh, are more better trained to deal with crowd control than uh, your average police officer. That said, there was a whole process breakdown around that op-ed uh, from June 2020. Look, I'm even calling them op-ed still, guest essay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that is really what uh, we are trying to, to avoid and prevent going forward. It's uh, part of a huge effort that we've undertaken to provide, like I said, more clarity, more context about why we are choosing the arguments and ideas that we want to have in our section. In addition to changing the name, we've taken steps such as providing more biographical information about the author of every piece that we run, as well as presenting to our audiences the number of pieces that we are running from many different angles on whatever the most important topics of the day are. One of your writers in the opinion section that I enjoy, find provocative and always stimulating is Brett Stevens, but he had a run in with you and your team recently when he <clears throat> wrote something, a guest, I mean, a column on uh, Don McNeil, a former New York Times writer. It was a complicated uh, issue. But he felt constrained, and I think you spiked his column. Walk me through that one. Sure, of course. I mean, we welcome, as you would see in the aftermath of the Tom Cotton situation, we welcome our columnists to weigh in on times situations, particularly when they become uh, major news events. Uh, you saw that with Brett wrote what I thought was a very well done column about 1619 and what he saw as the flaws in that project back in November of 2020. Um, you know, again, I welcome that. I thought he brought a lot of journalistic integrity to how he did that column. And I was glad that the opinion section could weigh in on that debate. That said, the bar for weighing in on Times, particularly personnel issues, is really high in my mind. And, uh, you know, I think that what happened specifically with the column you're referring to about Donald McNeil was that I don't think that Brett met that bar. 
And so I let him know that we weren't going to publish it. You know, it later was leaked and, uh, you know, you can find it in, I think it was printed in the New York Post so people can find it and read it and judge for themselves. But in the moment when there were a lot of fast moving things happening around Donald McNeil and his future at the New York Times, it didn't feel appropriate to let Brett um, weigh in on what was a lot of speculation in that moment. You talked about a moment ago the 1619 Project, which was this massive project that the newspaper undertook looking at the legacy of the first of uh, slavery in uh, the systems of America. Uh, that's engendered huge debate. Do you feel comfortable that the opinion section of the New York Times has weighed in fully on all sides of that debate? I do actually. Um, you know, we have run more than half a dozen pieces about 1619, which was an extraordinary project. It really changed the way so many Americans viewed our history, and um, I think was just spectacular. That said, we have run pieces that critique it, like Brett's, and we have run pieces that have been supportive, and then we've read run pieces that um, take a small angle in the project. We even had one of our columnists, Jamel Bowie, who was part of that project um, and who tried to illuminate uh, why there is so much debate and conversation around 1619. We talk often about cancel culture and deplatforming people. Uh, do you think that one of your goals can be and should be to resist that temptation of what is sometimes labeled cancel culture or deplatforming. I do. I do think that it's quite important to make sure that we are always bold and always courageous about interrogating ideas, even bad ones, maybe especially bad ones, because I think that is one of the most effective ways that we can um, you know, bat, bat them down when necessary. That said, I, I think that what we're seeing is um, a really complicated conversation. And I do think it's part of my department's uh, mission to make sure that we are de delving into it and trying to expose the many arguments. I mean, cancel culture, that means something totally different depending on who you ask. And so trying to make sure that we are talking about all the ways that people see that and making sure that we are, you know, um, frankly, pushing back on it as often as possible is definitely part of what we are trying to do this year. Uh, your audience is probably, uh, let me make a sweeping generalization, more on the progressive or left or center left of the spectrum when it comes to reading New York Times editorials. And historically, the New York Times has been a voice uh, somewhat of the left or center left or progressivism. And even in the argument, I notice uh, so many of the things tend to be arguments like, are Republicans driving us democracy into a ditch type arguments, which seem to come from a particular perspective. Does that make sense? Is that something you would just say, yes, we do have a general world viewpoint and we're proud of it? Or is it something that you feel should be uh, righted or changed? Interesting. One of my earliest memories is having a show and tell in preschool about going to the voting booth and uh, pulling the lever for Ronald Reagan. Uh, I, I think I share that story because I think that it creates a perception uh, that some people uh, will feel confirms many of the things that they think about me. And then, you know, um, uh, just as the fact that I won a Pulitzer Prize for a series that called for a $15 minimum wage and better treatment for immigrant workers. I, I say that story because it's really irrelevant what my personal worldview is or even what the section's worldview is. At the end of the day, if we want a healthy, thriving democracy, people need to encounter views that they both agree with and disagree with. I don't think that it's entirely fair to suggest that we are a progressive organization, and I, I would push back on that. Um, we are not representative of any political party, especially 
Um, we are running viewpoints. For instance, last summer we ran this um, very thoughtful piece by Jeffrey Rosen, who you'll remember was the deputy attorney general for Donald Trump on why we needed the death penalty. And we are trying to do that every day. Uh, I can give you countless examples from the last month of viewpoints that run counter to the idea that we are running um, progressive pieces exclusively. And so, you know, that's really what I'm trying to achieve every day uh, because I think it's really important. I think that we saw 74 million people vote for Donald Trump and Mike Pence in the last election. And for us to have um, real dialogue with those people who are still living in our country, we need to be able to um, publish pieces that speak to them too. Katie Kingsbury, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Thank you so much for having me.